This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Dr. Leslie Fiedler, State University of New York, lectures on the mythology of Indians and Negroes in American literature. Dr. Fiedler. The uh, proper title of this talk, as I didn't realize until about 10 minutes ago, is Red, White, and Black, or Showing Our True Colors. Uh, you may not appreciate that title, but I like it a lot, as a matter of fact. It's well to remember, at any rate, what we all know, yet managed somehow to forget, that this country was to begin with red, right? a land of red men. Though no one was really aware of that fact, not even the red men themselves, until white Europeans intent on establishing a new white home here discovered an alien people who possessed the land before them, a people whom they, the Europeans, called Indians or red men for the first time, lumping together groups that had until then thought of themselves as quite different from each other, as a matter of fact, as being each other's enemies. Mohawk and Mohican, Assiniboines and Sioux, Pawnee, Hopi, Navajo, and so forth. But the interesting thing and disconcerting thing, I think, is that inventing the redskin for the first time meant also inventing pale face for the first time. That is, white men who called all of the Indians red came to believe that enemy Dutchmen and Englishmen, Frenchmen and Spaniards and Germans and so forth were all somehow one as opposed to the red man. That is to say, they were white and hopefully Christian as opposed to red and the term various barbarian or savage or pagan. Now having defined this new world as divided against itself in terms of these two colors, the original white Americans discovered that they were tempted to resolve that kind of red-white polarity of American life by two kinds of schemes. From the beginning, we Americans have been tempted on the one hand by the notion of genocide, eliminate them, right, the stranger, and the notion of assimilation of one kind or another. But in either the case of genocide or assimilation, the assumption is that the white culture, the transplanted European culture, is superior, and that the other culture, the colored culture, the non-white culture, originally the red culture, has to yield to that higher culture or be destroyed. Now these two solutions, yield, assimilate, or be destroyed, wiped out completely, are represented in the deepest American imagination the very heart and root of our culture by two myths. Most of the things we really believe, we believe because they have come to us not through sermons or preaching or editorials or teaching, but through mythic stories. That is to say, stories which are told sometimes as fiction, sometimes as fact, sometimes in, as history, but are really parables or fables. And there are two parables or fables which pretend to be history which go back to the beginnings of Amer the American experience on this continent and which represent the two solutions. Let me describe them to you briefly. One of them you know quite well, and the other you will recognize as soon as you hear about it. The first myth, the first myth ever invented on the North American continent by the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants who had come here in the early 17th century, a story invented in the early 17th century is the myth of Pocahontas and Captain John Smith, which everybody knows because it is the most sentimental, the most false, the most misleading, the least useful of all myths which deal with the relations of the races in the New World. This is the myth of the love of love in the woods. You know the story. An Indian girl deeply moved by affection at the sight of our hero, about to have his brains beat out by her evil father, throws herself on top of his body and 
it saves him, stage one. Stage two, she runs to warn the new settlement at Jamestown that her own people are going to attack it. Pocahontas is a kind of pre-Uncle Tom right? uh, in female form. Following this double move, she doesn't manage to get the man she loved at first and saved and betrayed her own people for, but she settles for his friend, John Rolfe, for whose sake she is converted to Christianity, changes her name from Pocahontas, which means, in fact, Frisky, that's kind of interesting, to Rebecca, <laughs> goes to England, is received at court, marries John Rolfe and founds the first of the first families of Virginia and sets up a fortune in tobacco for her heirs forever after. This is an American success story of how to make it in the new world by assimilating the two races to each other. Not assimilating the two races to each other, I should say by the red skins assimilating to the pale faces. The other story, which is set off against the story of Pocahontas, the second basic American myth, is not invented until the end of the 17th century. And the names associated with it may well mean nothing at all to you, though at one time they were extremely famous. This is the myth of Hannah Dustin and the Indian Bampico, or the <coughs> Hannah Dustin was the mother of several children. She was living in a community which was attacked by Indians. Her husband, who believed that discretion was the better part of valor, apparently escaped with all of her children except one immediately, leaving poor Hannah to face the Indians. Nathaniel Hawthorne, who wrote about the story later on, said that he probably knew she was such a staunch and doughty character that she could face the Indians by herself and didn't need his help. But at any rate, uh, she was taken captive by the Indians, marched barefoot through the woods. She had just born a baby whose brains were beat out against a tree, which created in her, uh, you know, the desire for revenge, as is proper in the heart of a good Christian woman. Uh, as she was taken through the forest further and further, she was threatened with having to run the gauntlet naked. You know, there was a kind of threat of violation or rape floating someplace uh, in the distance someplace. But on one of their early stops, she worked out some plans and managed during the night when the poor Indians were sleeping uh, to kill 10 of them, <laughs> including seven children under 12, right? whom she then proceeded to scalp because there was a bounty of five pounds apiece on Indian scalps in those days. <laughs> this is another way to make it in early America. She took the scalps back and she was paid after some legal difficulties. You'll be pleased to hear the bounty which is coming to her. Now, let me pause for a moment over these two myths and reflect on the fact that to begin with, these two myths involve not only relations between races, white and red, but between the sexes, right? These are myths which combine a notion of race with a notion of sex. Myth number one, the myth of love in the woods, the myth of Pocahontas and John Smith, represents a dream of a blessed union between the white male and the red female, which will lead to the Indians being taken into white culture slowly. From the beginning, white men seem to have desired Indian girls. I discovered the other day that one of the first pictures ever made of America by the man who gave America his name, Americo Vespucci, portrays eight naked Indian girls in a row, apparently offered by the local chieftain to him when he landed. This was a tasty treat for a Renaissance gentleman. But the Pocahontas story is a cleaned up story. It's not just sexual exploitation of colored girls, it is marriage to them after they are properly converted, baptized, and rechristened. This is cleaned up dream of sexually assimilating the colored race, but it goes, you understand, it is only permitted when the male in the pair is white and the female in the pair is colored. The second story, the story of the relationship between Bampico and Hannah, Hannah Dustin, is a nightmare of a threatened conjunction, a rape rather than a marriage, between a red male and a white female. That's taboo, right? Because if a red male takes a white female in, this means that white culture is assimilated to red culture, and this is forbidden. 
At any rate, one of the results of the uh, effect of the Hannah Dustin story on the American imagination. It was an extremely popular story told and retold by everybody. Nathaniel Hawthorne, as I've said, Cotton Mather, uh, Thoreau, and so forth. The effect of this story on the American imagination is to create, to plant forever in the minds of Americans, red and white, and eventually black and brown and yellow as well, is to plant in the minds of all Americans the notion that the white woman the great white mother of us all, our Anglo-Saxon mama, right, <laughs> is the enemy of the dark savage, however noble that dark savage may be, and vice versa, the savage thinks of the white woman as his enemy. I mean, they, it, 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 this myth represents an eternal struggle between, between the white woman and the colored man, each of whom believes that for his own sake, the other must be degraded and destroyed. Now, if these were the only two myths which we have, I think our, the history of our country would have been even grimmer than it has, in fact, been. The third myth is invented last of all. As a matter of fact, it, it isn't written down any place until after we have fought a war for independence and have established our political identity as a separate nation. And you're not likely to know it in its original form, as it was originally published at the very beginning of the 19th century in an extraordinary book, which is called The Adventures of the Fur Trapper Alexander Henry. Henry David Thoreau, in a great book of his own, which is called A Week on the Concord and Merrimack Rivers, says that if a great epic poem is ever written about America, the basic materials will come out of the journals of the fur trapper Alexander Henry. What is this story? This is the story of the good companions in the wilderness, of the good male companions in the wilderness, of the good male red and white companions in a world without women. Right? This is a myth which imagines that the reconciliation is possible between white man and colored man if only white man will get out of civilization, leave the city, the home, the school, the church behind, and go to the wilderness, the river, the vast ocean, and there find himself a help meet unto him who turns out not to be a woman, but a colored man of one kind or another. Nasty name for this is a homosexual union, but we won't use any nasty word about it at this point, except to say it's an anti-female union of one kind. Now, though you're not likely to know this story as it was told by Alexander Henry, some of you may know it, if anybody still reads James Fenimore Cooper, as it was told by James Fenimore Cooper concerning the relationship between the white trapper Natty Bumpo and the Indian chieftain Chingachgook. I always manage to say Chingachgook someplace in a talk because I like to say uh, <laughs> that name, Chingachgook. Huh? Now this story, once imagined by James Fenimore Cooper, has been told over and over and over again. This story of men escaping from the surveillance of women and forming an alliance which crosses racial lines. It's been told in the kind of books that we think of as serious books, kind of books that are assigned in classrooms, all the way down to, say, William Faulkner and Norman Mailer, Why Are We in Vietnam is one of the last times it's told, for instance. But it's also been told over and over again in pop culture, down through the story of the Lone Ranger and his Indian pal Tonto, which most of you here are too young to remember, but some of you here are old enough so that you can never forget it again, <laughs> uh, all the way to the very latest Class B movies, TV serials, and so forth. More of you, however, are likely to remember this story, not as told by Cooper even, but as reinvented by Mark Twain and his successors. That is to say, you're likely to think of this myth in terms of the most widely read, I'm tempted to say the most American of all American books, Huckleberry Finn, in which the two partners who escaped from civilization are this time not an Indian and a white man, but for the first time in American literature and history, a Negro and a white man, a black man and a white man, Huckleberry Finn and Nigger Jim. 
Now, the questions with which I'm left by the, the things I've managed to say so far are these. Why did the red man turn into a black man in this great American dream of inter-ethnic unity and love? That's question number one. And why did it take so long for it to happen in American history? Remember that Huckleberry Finn was not written until the last decades of the 19th century, which is only yesterday, even in terms of our short American history. Now, obviously, as America turned from a rural country to an urban country, right? And as the, the results of the Civil War released black men from the farms of the South so that they swarmed northward into the expanding industrial cities, at the same moment that the Indian population was dwindling and dwindling and the red man's long war against the white man became less and less a fact of life and more and more something that you told stories about, at that point, it became clear that the characteristic encounter in America between the white man and an alien colored man was no longer the encounter between white man and red man, but was the encounter between white man and black man. But just think about how long it took and think about the explanation of it. For a long time, the black man existed as an economic fact of American life. He was brought here as an economic fact to be a slave. He existed as a social fact of American life, but there were no major Negroes in the American literature and no major black characters in the white American imagination. Even as late as the 1920s, you know, it was possible for D.H. Lawrence to write one of the best books about American literature and life, a book called Studies in Classic American Literature, which does not discuss a single book in which a black man is a major character, right? It was possible for D.H. Lawrence to say the real truth. It's hard for us to remember this when our headlines are all black and white nowadays. But as late as the 1920s, it was possible to write a book about the nature of American literature and the nature of American life, which was about, essentially, the relations of white men and red men, and not white men and black men at all. What, what, uh, what D.H. Lawrence wrote about in his books were James Fenimore Cooper and Benjamin Franklin and Poe and Melville and Hawthorne and Whitman, but he stopped short of Mark Twain. He stopped short of Huckleberry Finn, which is the book that makes all the difference. There's another book which D.H. Lawrence might have written about, which includes a Negro as a central character, which he did not even mention though it was written long before Huckleberry Finn, some 30 years before. This book is an extremely influential book. It's the first book which created for white readers in the United States, and as a matter of fact, in the whole Western world, a sentimental image of the American Negro. The book I'm talking about is the best bad book ever written by an American. It's a marvelous book of its own kind but its own kind is a very disturbing kind. I'm talking about Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which you don't even have to have read to know. Huh? That's one of the interesting things about Uncle Tom's Cabin. This is a book which is in every American's head, black and white, by the way, whether they have read it or not. Some Negro readers actually have loved this book. I read recently a statement by James Baldwin that when he was eight years old, he went out and got himself a copy of Uncle Tom's Cabin, which his mother kept trying to take away from him and hide, and eight times she hid it, and eight times he recovered it and read it again. What it did inside of his head, you'll have to figure out for yourself, since this is not a talk on James Baldwin uh, tonight. But black militants have always despised the book, like, I should hasten to add, uh, white militants. I mean, the two kinds of people who have hated Uncle Tom's Cabin are white segregationists and black militants, both of whom have claimed that uh, the book is a total lie because both black militants and white segregationists would dearly love to be, believe that the Negro is only a bad Indian and not Uncle Tom at all. The very word Tom has become, as almost everybody in the world knows, an epithet of contempt among Negroes for the kind of black man who doesn't face up to his own black responsibilities. Because Tom, uh, Uncle Tom seems to such readers a harmful and misleading model for political action, 
as well as a snide reflection on the manhood of all blacks. And blacks are, I guess, as sensitive and insecure about their maleness as whites or reds or anybody else. Nobody likes what he thinks of as a travesty of his own boast of masculinity. I think, actually, people would have been much less disturbed, both black and white readers, by Uncle Tom's Cabin if they had realized what now seems a clear and obvious fact, that Uncle Tom is not really a portrait of the ancestors of present-day blacks in America, whom Harriet Beecher Stowe, as her enemies were quick to point out, didn't know. She didn't know Negroes. She certainly didn't know Southern slaves. What Uncle Tom really is is a self-portrait in blackface of a long-suffering white Christian lady, right? It's a self-portrait of Harriet Beecher Stowe. <laughs> Uncle Tom is, permit me to say, a white mother uh, in blackface. <laughs> Mrs. Stowe herself says at one point, talking about her dying child, at his bedside, she said, I, as a mother, realized what it feels like to be a black slave. At the bedside of my dying child, she said, I realized what it feels like to be a black slave. I, I guess what this really means, if you, if you try to get through to the heart of it, is that Mrs. Stowe made a clear identification in her mind of the relations which existed between black slaves and white slave owners. She thought of this as being quite similar to the relationship which existed in the 19th century between white women and their insufferable white husbands and the insufferable white god whom their white husbands had invented. I think Mrs. Stowe thought of as the, the struggle between a black slave and white slave owner as being just like the struggle between white woman and white man, white husband. White women who in those days had no rights except the right to suffer. And it was this which led her to recommend for the blacks what white Christian women in the 19th century had believed to be their own sole recourse, to forgive and pray for their oppressors, to hope for repentance on the part of those who oppressed them, a kind of repentance which was brought about by submissive love and passive resistance on their own part. The history of recent black protests can be written in terms, I think, of the three mythological versions of the relations between blacks and whites that I've laid out for you so far. And if one were doing this, I think, attempting to talk about it in such terms, he would begin with a stage not so very far back in the past when the black civil rights movement was in fact a kind of black feminism, it was a movement which was just like the feminist movement for civil rights for women or votes for women, in which the protest is basically Christian, basically nonviolent, a movement not for power but for rights, and a movement in this sense analogous to the one which did in fact get women their civil rights by patience and forgiveness and prayer and passive non-resistance, passive resistance. That first phase was brought to a close even before the assassination of Martin Luther King, which in fact, I mean, he died in a way posthumously in terms of his influence on the black movement. In a way, Martin Luther King represents a triumphant transfiguration, the last possible triumphant transfiguration of Uncle Tom. And I mean Uncle Tom as Mrs. Stowe dreamed him rather than as Uncle Tom was travestied by militant critics, black and white, who've never really understood his significance or his pathos. But the time of Uncle Tom was over, and when we moved into the stage represented by SNCC, by a kind of alliance of young people, black and white together, we move into a stage which is presided over by the myth of the good companions in the wilderness, by the myth of Chingachgook and Natty Bumpo, by the myth of Jim and Huck on the raft. It's interesting how the costume changes, even. Martin Luther King always came on dressed like a white minister in white society, like a polite, good Christian. When the SNCC kids came on, they came on dressed alike, black and white, in denim jackets and blue jeans. They were sons of the West, spiritual descendants of that miscegenation between Huck and Jim on the raft, right? At any rate, we've passed to stage three. Now, stage three has its own appropriate costume, which declares its mythological meanings, just as stage one and two had. We're not in the preacher's 
preaching suit anymore. We're not in the Levi's and jean jackets of black and white comrades in the small towns of Mississippi. But now we begin to have a movement in which turbans and robes, Afro hairstyles, emulations of an African or primitive style of one kind or another become, begins to become more and more common as the black movement declares its desire to go native in effect to assert not the possibility of companionship or the possibility of a community in America, but the threat of a strangeness which can't be overcome, an inalienable difference which exists inside of white America but is not part of white America. And the point I would like to, like to make is that despite the African trappings and the new mythologies invented by black Muslim and black Panther groups and so forth, I think what we can recognize in the new black militants, disconcertingly, uncomfortably, is an old, old friend, or rather an old, old enemy. Our oldest enemy, it looks as if the blacks in America have decided to become bad Indians again. Nothing but bad Indians. Not out of the trap, completely, but out of one trap into another. Down with Uncle Tom. We're not going to ride on that raft with you anymore, Huck. Where are you going to go? What distresses me especially, what's distressing, I think, to all people among the whites who once dreamed of a comradeship between races that could transcend a history of hostility and degradation on both sides, because the oppressor degrades himself as well as the person he oppresses. And white people need the liberation of blacks, not for the sake of blacks, but for the sake of their own miserable white soul. I think one of the things that distresses whites and blacks alike is the thought that maybe, maybe, maybe in this ridiculous America of ours, we are condemned forever, black and white, to move about in this mythological trap. And I should hate to think that black people were condemned forever to smash their heads against the prison walls of a mythology which white men invented for them. Now, to escape from that trap is obviously going to require, eventually, and in the long run, political action, right? Action in the streets, politics. But the action can't begin, it seems to me, until somebody first has imagined a way out, which then somebody can follow. And my own feeling, speaking as a writer, is that what we need at this moment more than anything in the world is a black writer who is capable of dreaming for his own black people, a communal dream, capable of inventing a myth of blackness, which is as potent as Cooper's myth of redness, or Twain's of blackness, or Harriet Beecher Stowe's, though this time, of course, it will be a black dream of blackness, not a white dream projected on the blacks a dream which will be capable of liberating not only blacks, but whites as well, from, you know, the, the, this, this essential milling about in the same worn out mythologies. We've been dreaming these dreams together for too long. And I have the sense now, you know, that everybody is tired of them, not only the blacks, but the whites too. I have the sense that what we're really trying to do and this is the moment that requires a great writer, a great poet, a great novelist, a great playwright, a great I don't want to stress it. What we all want to do is wake up from all nightmares and dreams. Those nightmares and dreams in which we're thrashing about in such a crazy way that we all end up just beating each other. You have been listening to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today, Dr. Leslie Fiedler, State University of New York, spoke on the mythology of Indians and Negroes in American literature.
University Lectures, a presentation of Iowa State University Radio.